now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. And on this Sunday edition of the podcast, we're going to go back to September 29th, 1957, 67 years ago today, for episodes of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Suspense. Uh, And the Suspense episode will star Vanessa Brown. We'll tell you a little bit about her. Also, an episode of Counter Spy from this date in 1949. Gangbusters from 1945, the case of John K. Giles, an escape artist. And another episode of Superman and the Metropolis football team poisoning. That's all coming up straight ahead on this Sunday. This is the 29th day of September. And this is the 273rd day of the year, 93 days remaining, a special day for Dobie Gillis fans. Uh, The U.S. War Department first established a regular army with a strength of several hundred men in 1789. On that same date, the first U.S. Congress adjourned. In 1907, the cornerstone laid at Washington National Cathedral in the capital. 1943, General Eisenhower and Italian Marshal Pietro uh, Bagdoglio signed an armistice aboard the British ship Nelson off the shore of Malta. On this date in 1959, the premiere of The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. Dobie. Dobie. Shulman's short stories adapted for scripts for the show. Dwayne Hickman starred as Dobie, and his best friend Maynard G. Krebs, played by the be- real beatnik type, played by Bob Denver. Yeah, later to be Gilligan on Gilligan's Island. In 1973, Vice President Spiro T. Agnew declared he was totally innocent of charges that he accepted bribes when he was governor of Maryland. I am innocent of the charges against me. I want to make another thing so clear that it cannot be mistaken in the future. Because of these tactics which have been employed against me, because small and fearful men have been frightened into furnishing evidence against me, they have perjured themselves in many cases, it's my understanding. I will not resign if indicted. I will not resign if indicted. Now, on October 10th of 1973, uh, Spiro T. Agnew allowed to plead no contest to a single charge that he had failed to report $29,500 of income received in 1967 with the condition that he resign the office of vice president. Nixon later replaced Agnew by appointing House Minority Leader Gerald Ford as vice president, who would later 
take assume the office of president when President Nixon resigned. 1978, after presiding over the Roman Catholic Church for just 34 days, Pope John Paul I died suddenly at the Vatican. Among those shocked by the news, Vice President Walter Mondale. It is uh, saddening, shocking, and indeed unbelievable that this remarkable personality would be taken from us so quickly. His successor would be appointed and take the name Pope John Paul II. In 1982, a Tylenol scare began when the first of seven individuals died in metropolitan Chicago after ingesting extra-strength Tylenol that had been deliberately contaminated with cyanide. It's very obvious that these capsules were tampered with. It was not an accidental thing. It was not a product defect. It was not some, something that was occurred in the uh, uh, stream of distribution. It was willful and wanton and very deadly. Johnson & Johnson spokesman Tyrone Fanner. The crime was never solved. And thus you had all of these medications go away from using capsules, many of which dissolve much easier than tablets, and everybody went to tablets, which don't work as effectively. Uh, 1988, NASA resuming space shuttle flights, grounded after the Challenger disaster. In 1996, Nintendo releasing the Nintendo 64 in North America. And uh, you know how you fix most issues with the Nintendo 64. You blow in them. <laughs> That's how everybody fixed the Nintendo and usually worked. Usually. 2005, the Senate confirmed John Roberts to be the next Chief Justice of the United States. And I'm looking. I thought I had audio on that, but I don't. So we'll go on. Following the bankruptcies of Lehman Brothers and Washington Mutual, the Dow Jones Industrials fell 777.68 points, the largest single-day point loss in its history to that time. The House defeated a $700 billion emergency rescue plan for the nation's financial system. I had, oh gosh, weeks before, I had moved all of my banking out of Washington Mutual and moved it to something at the time called NetBank. And uh, NetBank, a very well-run institution, but dramatically undercapitalized. No brick-and-mortar banks, and um, I had zero issues with the institution. But they went belly up, and they were absorbed by Capital One, as I recall. And... Uh, I used them for a period of time before I had to go back to a brick-and-mortar bank to handle some of the stuff that I was dealing with at the time. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, passing away on this date in history. Baseball player manager Casey Stengel. Businessman Henry Ford II. Cartoonist Charles Adams, the creator of the Adams Family. Actor Tony Curtis. And singer Helen Reddy. Uh, birthdays on this date include actress Greer Garson, actor-singer businessman Gene Autry, and also a broadcaster as well. Uh, he owned several radio stations at one point in time. Film director Stanley Kramer, actress Anita Ekberg, pro wrestler best known as a manager, Skandor Akbar. Uh, his management was probably best known. Uh, to most people today. The last surviving member of Sun Records' Million Dollar Quartet of Elvis, Carl Perkins, and Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, passing away on, uh, born on this date in history. And uh, Frank Burns from MASH, Larry Linville, born on this date. And actress Madeline Kahn. All those folks have gone to their great beyond, but they were all born on this date in history. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. Among people born on this date, French jazz violinist Jean-Luc Ponty is 82 today. His uh, single Mirage, Jean-Luc Ponty, born on this date in history. Composer Mike Post is 80. (music) 
Among a lot of his compositions, a theme from Law and Order, Mike Post, 80 years old today. TV personality Brian Gumble is 76. Hello, and welcome to our special Real Sports Overtime. I'm Brian Gumble. Brian Gumble, 76 years old today. Grand Funk Railroad singer, songwriter, guitarist Mark Farner, 76 today. John Black on Days of Our Lives, Drake Hodgson is 71. Andrew Dice Clay, Hickory Dickory Dock, the comedian, 67. Love Boat's Jill Wayland is 58. Baywatch actress and former Playboy Playmate in 1989, Arena Eleniak is 55. Stand-up comic Russell Peters is 54. From This Is Us, Chrissy Metz is 44, also 44. Uh, from Chuck and Sirzam, Zachary Levy is 44. Singer Halsey is 30. Tell me how you feel sitting up there. Feeling so high, but too far away to hold me. You know I'm the one who put you up there. Deep in the sky, does it ever get lonely? Thinking you could live. Halsey, 30 years old today, and from Loki and American Honey, Sasha Lane is 29. Those just a few of the people celebrating the 29th day of September as their birthday, and if this is your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you! And our feature focus today is on Sunday, September 29th, 1957, with episodes of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Suspense. That's coming up next. We'll also take a look at the news. Oh, and I got something special for some of our listeners today. That's up next here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Despite overwhelming support from Democrats and Republicans, time is running out for Congress to pass the AM Radio for Every Vehicle Act, which will keep AM radio in cars. Text AM to 52886 and ask Congress to bring this bill to a vote now. AM radio is too important to let this moment pass us by. Message and data rates may apply. You may receive up to four messages a month and you may text STOP to STOP. This message furnished by the National Association of Broadcasters. So I, I've had some people uh, comment that they they were not familiar with W.C. Fields very much. And I can understand that because Fields died in, I, I want to say, let's see, he died in uh, 1946. And either just before or just after he passed, an album was released or a record was released of W.C. Fields, and it's entitled, The Day I Drank a Glass of Water, W.C. Fields. It is a sunny California afternoon, and we find W.C. Fields seated on his patio, strumming his guitar, as he is being interviewed by Miss Ophelia Snapdorp of the Lompoc Bugle. It's nice of you to grant me this interview, Mr. Fields. Think nothing of it, my beauty. I'm always glad to speak for the public print. Well, I think I have about all I need. There's just one more question, Mr. Fields. What is it, my beauty? Is it true that you once drank a glass of water? <laughs> Gods, what an accusation. I haven't had a drop of water on my tongue since the gold rush days. I was up in Nome, Alaska, and I made the mistake of picking my teeth with an icicle. The icicle melted and I nearly strangled to death. Those were the happy days. I hope they'll never come again. I crossed the frozen tundra with my trusty dog team, which I ate later. They were very good with whipped cream. At long last, I arrived at the igloo of an Eskimo friend of mine who distilled a delectable beverage from whale blubber. Well, that's all very interesting. But uh, when did you drink the glass of water? Oh, yes, you remember that, don't you? The water. That was 35 years ago. And I was talking to Tex Rickard and Death Valley Scotty in the old Victoria Hotel bar. 
I left the cafe and walked down Broadway. I must have been uh, thinking. For the next thing I knew, I was struck by a runaway street organ in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. The entrepreneur of this musical cavalcade, an Italian gentleman, was most profuse in his apologies. His poor frightened monkey bit me in the stomach in his excitement. <laughs> Were you ever bitten in the stomach by a wild monkey? No. Oh. I was rushed to the hospital. Soon after being hospitalized, I took a turn for the nur uh, worse. My nurse, Miss Dorothea Fizzle Daco, was pretty, starched and blonde, with cheeks like peaches and cream, which I had for breakfast every morning. Things went along smoothly into one day when my doctor entered my room to find that I had a half Nelson on Miss Fizzle Dockall in an effort to rest a vial of rubbing alcohol from her determined grip. Uh, Miss Fizzle Dockall was immediately replaced by a male nurse. I recently received a postcard from Dorothea in a bottle. She is in one of the Cuckoo Islands in the Pacific, and perfectly happy, except that a mosquito carried off a pet dog while she was napping on the beach. But what about your drinking the water? Oh, yes, you back to the arcade, yes. I was driving across the Mojave Desert in search of the lonesome Charlie Gold Mine. And by chance, I happened to come upon the Happy Buzzard gas station and tap room. I entered the tap room and said to the barkeep, Double slug of red eye, please. And he replied, Sorry, no liquor, partner. What of the sign that swings outside proclaiming the Happy Buzzard? How can a buzzard be happy without a nip? Well, this is election day, partner, and oh. the bar is closed. It's the law. Who made this law? The people voted for it. That's carrying democracy too far. Well, if you're so thirsty, how about a nice glass of water? Are you insane? Say, ain't you W.C. Fields? No autographs, please. I guess I am insane. Asking you to drink a glass of water... Well, I'd bet a hundred dollars you wouldn't do that. Of course I wouldn't. Did you say one hundred dollars? A century note? Yep. Get your money up. Okay. Here's my money and here's your glass of water. Ugh. Hideous looking stuff. Don't you put an olive or a cherry or some formaldehyde in it? Nope. Just plain water. All right. I'll drink it. May the state of Kentucky forgive me. Well, <clears throat> here's over the lip. Well, I must be seeing things. W.C. Fields is reaching for a glass of water. He's lifting it from the bar. There it goes up to his lips and there goes my hunter. He's just starting to drink. No, no, he's putting it back in the bar. Oh. Whoops, he's lifting it to his lips again. He grits his teeth. Fuck, cracky, he's... He's a-drinking that water. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mr. Fields, Mr. Fields, oh, what's wrong? Oh, get a doctor, you idiot. I've been poisoned. <laughs> Couple of more notes on W.C. Fields. His last radio appearance was on March 24, 1946, on the Edgar Berg and Charlie McCarthy show. Just before his passing, he recorded uh, this side, The Day I Drank a Glass of Water, and he also recorded the Temperance Lecture. Uh, we'll find that. And it was recorded at Les Paul's studio, where he had installed a new multi-track machine. Listening to one of Paul's experimental multi-track recordings, Fields said, The music you're making sounds like an octopus. Like a guy with a million hands, I've never heard anything like it. Paul was amused, and he named his new machine Oct. 
short for octopus. Session arranged by one of Fields radio writers, Bill Morrow. Fields reading his scripts from large print cue cards and with his deliberately notably slower than usual, still succeeded in doing funny and flavorful monologues about demon rum. It was his final performance. And that's what you just heard. Uh, W.C. Fields, William Claude Dukenfield, who uh, was born in January 29th of 1880 and passed away Christmas Day, 1946. All right. When Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues, we will go back to 67 years ago today, September 29th, 1957. Uh, these two shows that we have today, we do not have uh, either line recordings or uh, over-the-air recordings, but we do have Armed Forces radio recordings of these shows. As such, the original commercials are not in here. But you'll hear Bob Bailey up first uh, from 67 years ago and the doubtful dairy matter. A wise farmer knows that he must get his livestock under cover to protect them from radioactive fallout. An attack may never come, but it's wise to prepare now. Many of those plans are available online. Doesn't hurt to have CivilDefenseMuseum.com. Okay, we start off on a uh, Sunday, September 29th, 1957, 67 years ago today. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey and the Doubtful Dairy Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Peter Hardy at Tri-Western Property and Casualty Insurance. Hi, how are things in the Golden West? You still in Reno? Sure am. Good boy. What goes, Pete? A little trouble with a big dairy farm out here, Johnny. Amenian dairy. Okay, Pete, tell me all. A year and a half ago in a fire, Amenian lost one of his silos. You know, one of those big towers where they store and cure a lot of chopped up corn and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. Cost us $21,000. 21000 for a silo? This time it's a compound silo, and the claim is for 56000 Oh. But I don't want to pay it. I don't blame you. Sure, because, Johnny, I think it was arson. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Western Property and Casualty Insurance Company, Reno, Nevada office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the doubtful dairy matter. Expense account item one, 141.20. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Reno, Nevada. It was about 9 a.m. when I arrived, so I checked into the Mapes Hotel, then walked over to Pete Hardy's office. Armenian dairies are just north of here, Johnny, in Warm Springs Valley off Route 33. Well, then I'd better rent me a car. Or you can use mine. Now, now, Pete, how can I run up my expense account unless I have something to run it up with? Johnny, for one... T- uh uh-uh. <sighs> Anyhow, the reason why these silos Amenian has are so expensive. Is that the owner's name, by the way? Yes, Aram Amenian. And I take it he's Armenian? Strangely enough, no. Now, he's had all his silos very specially built. Oh, how specially can you build a silo? Just a concrete base, a lot of long wooden staves to get the circular shape, and a good roof on top. Well, he has some trick with them inside. Like what? That's his deep, dark secret. But he claims it makes better silage for his cattle than is possible anywhere else in the world. And one of these things burned up a year and a half ago. The word exploded best describes it. Yeah. And as I said, cost us 21000 And now the replacement has gone up in plan. Yes, day before yesterday. He filed the claim the same day. Well, why do you suspect arson? Did the local authorities find anything suspicious? No, but you go out and talk with Amenian, Johnny. And if you don't end up with the same kind of feeling I have, well, I'll leave my shirt. <laughs> Expense account item two, $50. Deposit on a drive-your-own car. Finding the Amenian Dairy and Ranch some 20 miles north of the city was easy. It was spread out all over the countryside. Hundreds of acres of well-irrigated, lush green pastures. Square in the middle of the ranch sat one of the cleanest, most modern dairies I ever saw. 
Aram Amenian gave me the grand tour, and I must say I was impressed. There was close to 200 well-kept Guernseys in the main barn, which was clean as a whistle. The milking machines, coolers, separators, clarifiers, and so on were the same. Yep, a prosperous-looking setup. Finally, Mr. Amenian took me out to where a small group of workmen were cleaning up what was left of his compound silo. As you can see, Mr. Dollar, only the concrete base is left. That must have been a pretty big silo, Mr. Amenian. That's the largest and most efficient in the entire West. Still, $56,000. Oh, the size had nothing to do with that. It was the inner construction, known only to Barnwell, the man who built it for me, and to myself, of course. Well, what was so special about it? Principally a method of venting. Venting? Yes, it increases the phosphorus and lactic acid content. Well, I thought the point in the silo was to keep it pretty well sealed up. Venting within, Mr. Dollar. But that's all I'll tell you about it. It cost me 56000 to have Barnwell build it. And I wish the company to pay my claim as quickly as possible, because I'm starting construction on a new one immediately. Of the same type? Oh, the vastly improved type. Oh, then it was to your advantage to lose the old one. Just what do you mean by that? Your loss came at just the right time, didn't it? Now, well, just a minute, Doc. With the insurance money, you can build a new and better one. And when it gets out of date, I suppose you'll have another fire. Oh, I see. You, uh, you think perhaps these last two were deliberately set? Were they? Ridiculous. Is it? But if they were... Yeah. If they were, I, I certainly wouldn't know it. Oh, come on now. After what you've just said... And what's more, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure you'll never be able to prove it. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We sometimes wonder, what is the life of a human being really worth? Not too much? Or maybe a great deal? Does it depend on whose life it is? Whatever the answer, one thing is certain. Fred Hargesheimer, since World War II, has felt that his life is worth quite a lot. Quite a lot of gratitude. During the war in the Pacific, about June of 1943, Lieutenant Hargesheimer had his P-38 fighter plane shot out of the sky. Badly wounded, he bailed out over a tiny island, New Britain. It looked pretty small from where he hit the silk, but he found it much bigger when he hit the ground. It was bigger, and in complete control of the enemy. But Hargesheimer was lucky. After a month of lonely hiding, he was found by a group of friendly natives from the village of Nantambu. They cared for him and successfully hid him from enemy patrols for the next four months at the risk of their own lives. Then Hargesheimer was able to make it back to civilization. For the next 17 years, Fred Hargesheimer thought about those wonderful people of Nantambu. 12,000 miles away in the United States of America, Hargesheimer put a great plan into effect. He made speeches, took up collections, sold jewelry belonging to his family and worked out a way to bring a bit of civilization and happiness to the little village of Nantambu. Needless to say, the villagers gave him a spectacular welcome upon his return. Fred Hargesheimer showed his gratitude to the people who had saved his life. But life is worth little without freedom. The right of all men. Everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Doubtful Dairy Matter. By what he said and the way he said it, Aram Amenian was practically challenging me to find out how Arson was involved in the destruction of his $56,000 secretly constructed compound silo. Expense account item three phone call from a gas station on Highway 33 to Reno Police Headquarters. But Lieutenant Brady of the Arson Squad assured me he'd failed to find anything indicating the fire was set. So dead end. Until I remembered a little trick that had worked for her me before and might work again. Item 4, 27 cents for a loaf of white bread at a grocery store along the highway. Then I drove back to the Amenian Ranch. If I had known you were hungry, Mr. Dollar, I should have had something provided for you at the ranch house, in spite of your rather nasty attitude about this loss of mine. Food is the last thing I'm thinking of, Mr. Amenian. Well, then why this loaf of bread, if you're not... Whoop. Now, let's see. Oh, now, surely you're not going to eat the piece that dropped in the ashes. No. No, no. Well, then get it out of your mouth, man. Well, mm-hmm. 
Whatever in the world are you doing, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, I knew it. You knew what? A sure, a sure test for kerosene, Mr. Armenian. What? Yeah, fresh bread dropped in the ashes of a fire even days after the fire is out. I don't understand. I can still taste the kerosene. And, mister, it makes things look pretty bad for you. Me? Oh, good heavens, man, you can't... Dollar, I resent this, this completely unfounded accusation. Go right ahead and resent. Or better still, let me get hold of a stenographer and you can dictate a confession. Get out of here. Want to do it the hard way, huh? Get off this ranch, Dollar. Now leave. Immediately. Sure. But I warn you, don't come back. Because if you do... Better be careful, Mr. Armenian. The kind of a threat you're about to make wouldn't sound very good in court. Get out. Get out. Out on the highway, I stopped at the mobile gas station again and made another phone call. Item five, another 20 cents. It was to my old friend, Herb Carlbert, cashier of Reno's Farm Trade National Bank. It was past closing time, but he promised to leave a door open for me. So I grabbed a sandwich and a Coke along the way. That's item six, 80 cents, including tip. Then at the bank, Herb led me back to his private office. Oh, sit down, Johnny. Tell me all about yourself. Yeah, later, Herb. We'll go out on the town and talk our heads off. Right now, I need some information. I hope you can tell me where to get it. Oh? Information about what? The Armenian Dairy. Or better still, Armenian himself. You know him? Oh, I certainly do. We're his bank. His happens to be one of the best accounts we have, especially in our investment department. You mean it's big? <laughs> Funny big. Like how much? Well, now, Johnny. I'll tell you this. If I had a quarter of his net worth, I'd have retired long ago. No big outstanding debts on his place? Anything like that? Not a penny. Aram's financial condition is his... Now, wait a minute. Yeah? That fire and explosion of his compound silo? Yeah, that's right. Herb, I've found evidence indicating our... Well, certainly aren't accusing him. Who else? Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. Oh, now, look, Herb, he filed that claim so fast. It's the most natural thing in the world for him. It's the way he does everything, like paying his bills immediately on receipt. He works that way. You expect everybody else to. Well, he gave me the impression he wanted to collect quickly in order to have money for rebuilding. Of course. Rather than cash in some of his blue chip investments. Herb, somebody fired that silo. Well, it certainly wouldn't be Aaron. Ah, you sound like you're in cahoots with him. <laughs> what about his employees? From my impression of the man... They seemed... love him like a father. Every one of them. And if every employer was as generous as he is, there wouldn't be any labor troubles in this country. Well, the fact remains that somebody somehow stood to profit by destroying that silo and the one before it. Well, I can't imagine who. Even his competitors like and respect the man. Oh, so they say. No, 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 they do. He's helped them stay on their feet during hard times, develop new ideas and methods, then pass them on to them. Oh, the fact remains... Well, Johnny, Johnny, I've had a rough day. How about a nice, cool, casual drink? Then we'll have dinner and take in the town. <laughs> Item 7, 2130, for drinks and a good dinner back at the Mapes. But I didn't enjoy either. Because Herb and his defense of a median was no help at all. Except perhaps for giving me a list of all the people he could think of who did business with him. I decided to check them all first thing in the morning. Finally, about midnight, having lost our share at a couple of nearby gambling clubs, we parted. Herb drove away to his home on the outskirts of town. I went back to the Mapes. Uh, take Mr. and Mrs. Kenworthy to room 314, boy. Yes, sir. What can... Oh, Mr. Dolly. Uh, oh, just my key, please. Certainly, sir. Here you are, sir. And I hope you enjoy a pleasant night's rest. Thanks. Oh, by the way, there was a gentleman here looking for you early this evening. Uh, hung around quite a while. Said he'd be back. Well, who was he? Well, he didn't give his name, sir, nor did he wish to leave a message. Mr. Amenian? Mr. Amenian the Dairyman? Oh, no, sir. I'm quite sure. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? There he is. There. Huh? Going out the door, the dark brown coat. You're sure? Yes, sir. The same man. I wonder. Yeah, so do I. But, but if he knows you, sir, and saw you, sir. By the time I got out the front door, the man in the brown coat was halfway down the block and walking fast. Faster and faster, as a matter of fact, as I gained on him. He turned the corner, and by this time, both of us were running. Hey! Hey! Were you looking for me? By the end of three or four blocks, it was a real foot race. Then suddenly he turned into an alley, and like a darn fool, I plunged into the darkness of it after him. Hey! Hey! Right here! Oh, no, you... Act 
three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. New Hampshire state flag carries its state seal on a field of dark blue. The seal is surrounded by a wreath of laurel leaves, the symbol of peace, interspersed with nine stars because New Hampshire was the ninth state to join the Union. The heart of the state seal is a representation of the frigate Raleigh, recalling the glory of the early days of sail. New Hampshire state flag, the flag of the ninth state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 29, 1931. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Doubtful Dairy Matters. If it hadn't been for a big interstate moving van that drove into the alley where I'd been waylaid, well, I have a strong hunch I wasn't supposed to have lived through that beating. The truck driver, who absolutely refused a tip, incidentally, half walked, half carried me back to the MAPES. And the desk clerk had a doctor in my room within a few minutes. A uh, terrible thing. A terrible thing, Mr. Dollar. You're being attacked like this? And, of course, I'll have to make a report of it at the police. Oh, uh, do anything you like, Doctor. Just, oh, just get me patched up with you. And you? Me you now. Uh, you, uh, you have no idea who could have done this to you? Believe me, I intend to find out. Judging by this swollen hand of yours, you got in some good licks, though, and whoever... <laughs> What's the matter? Well, this is a very unusual ring, your way. Oh, some kids in the YMCA gave it to me a couple of years ago when I helped them with the softball team. Oh, yes, of course. That's the Y insignia. Yeah, one of them made it. And the three raised points stand for spirit, body, and mind. Yeah, that's they? right. Well, now, if you just... Oh, wait, what's that for? To make sure you get plenty of rest. Oh, no, no, now, wait, Doc. I'm the doctor. Roll up your sleeve, please. Here, I'll do it. Look, if this shot leaves me groggy in the morning... you wake up feeling fine. There you are. Incidentally, that ring... Listen, before you notify the police... Oh, hey, this... This shot works pretty fast. Yep. As I started to say, uh, if that ring of yours didn't leave a mark on whomever you defended yourself against out there in the alley, I'm very much surprised. In a few seconds, I was out like a light. But then a whole set of weird dreams began to plague my somewhat battered mind. And questions about who would attack me and why. Only the why was only too obvious to keep me from finding an arsonist who... Yeah, yeah, who probably bore the mark of my ring on his kisser. I thought of the names Herb had given me and his insistence that none of them could be guilty. Wait a minute. There was one name he hadn't mentioned, but a median had, of one man who stood to gain a lot by the destruction of the silos. Or maybe it was just a crazy hunch, part of the wild dreams that came from the beating I'd taken. In any event... In the morning, as soon as the bank was open, I was in Herb Carlbert's office again. Well, yes, he has an account here too, Johnny. At least he did before. How about loans? Has this man we're talking about taking out any loans? Well, yes, but... Now, oh, Johnny, you know I... Can... Yeah, I know, I know. The fact remains, he's pretty hard up for dough, isn't he? Well, I didn't say that. Although, of course, if that's the conclusion you choose to draw... Tell me this. He owes the bank money now, doesn't he? Yeah. All right. Did he also owe the bank a lot of money about a year and a half ago? Johnny. Yeah. Well? Johnny, you're right. But who would have suspected... And when you consider that Aram Aminian is the one man who has given him money for all the work he's... I can't believe it. Herb, it started out as a pure hunch, but right now I'd bet my... Where can I find him? Well, if Aram plans to go ahead with new construction, sure, he's probably... Sure, sure. Out there at the dairy. You want to come along? Well, maybe I'd better after the way Aram threatened you. I guess I owe him an apology for the way I tore into him. Let's go. Johnny. Yeah? What... What if we're wrong... What if this man we think is the arsonist... Will you agree that the firebug is the same man who attacked me in the alley? Well, I suppose so. Then we'll soon know. Because believe me, he's a marked man. We made the Amenian carry in 30 minutes flat, and we're told at the gate that Aram Amenian was in the pasteurizing plant. Uh, 
Maybe you better let me talk to Aram first, Johnny. It's not Aram that I'm interested in, Herb, and you know it. Oh, just a minute. Huh? What's the matter? Hold it a second, will you, while I tie my shoelace? Yeah, sure. And I've been thinking, Johnny, on the way out, you know, we could really be terribly, terribly wrong. Herbert, Herbert, old man. Aram, we're just looking for you. Well, when I heard the car pull up, I thought it was Joe Barnwell. He's due here to show me final plans for the new silo he's gone to. Well, it's a dollar. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Meaning. I want to apologize for... Well, what's the matter? That dressing on your cheek. What about it? Just what is that little bandage hiding? Johnny? Well, I mean, in... As a matter of fact, I cut myself shaving this morning. Well, I'm sorry, mister, but that bandage is going to have to come off. Look, Johnny. Now, oh, just a minute, Dollar. Ah, here you are, Aram. Here's the final blueprint for it. Why... What's wrong, Joe? Uh, gentlemen, this is Mr. Joseph Barnwell. Herb Carlbert. We know each other. And Mr. Johnny Dollar. Yeah. I think we know each other, too, Barnwell. Huh. Oh, do we? Joe, did you have an accident of some sort? Your face. What's going to happen to him now won't be any accident, Mr. Armenian. And I apologize for doubting that you cut yourself with a razor. What? I'm afraid I don't understand. But that bandage on your face doesn't hide any razor cut, does it, Barnwell? Well, huh. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, then let's rip it off. You certainly won't. What the... Good heavens, Johnny. Yeah, look. The mark from the ring on my hand where I struck him last night. Okay, Barnwell. Now, now stop. Don't don't touch me. Start talking. <clears throat> Tell Amenian how you burned up his fancy, expensive silo so you could build another one. <clears throat> how you burned the other one up. I... Talk. I swear I... Talk. <clears throat> 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 Yeah, he talked all right, plenty. About a racket so old, I hadn't heard of it in years. The crooked builder who burned out his own plans to get himself more work. And in this case, a natural, because he was the only one who shared Aram's secret construction plan. And by the time I was through with him, he blabbed about some of the other clients he'd taken the same way. Expense account total, including incidentals and the trip back to Hartford, $418 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star, Bob Bailey, will return in just a moment to give you a hint about what's in store for you on next week's program. Meantime, listen carefully. There is a biblical verse which promises life is going to be better for everybody in the world when mercy and truth are met together and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. When the people of the United States of America express that thought, it is not in idleness, but in deeds. Today, it is common knowledge that when the gigantic earthquakes and tidal waves struck the Republic of Chile and South America not too long ago, thousands of lives were lost and tens of thousands were left homeless, hungry, and suffering. Immediate aid in the form of food, medicine, clothing, supplies, and professional and technical help were flown to Chile by the United States Air Force in a Mercy airlift. When the work was done and the suffering people made happier and more comfortable, American servicemen received such grateful thanks from the people of Chile that they felt increased pride in being able to wear the uniform of the United States of America. This same pride has come to other Americans in uniform when mercy and truth have come together to follow the wake of disaster in other parts of the world. After the earthquake in Agadir, Morocco, after two devastating cyclones swept across the Bay of Bengal into East Pakistan. After a typhoon rocked and battered Japan. As mercy and truth got together, so did peace and righteousness to form a pact for freedom. The right of all men everywhere. And now, here is our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Next week, while I get into cattle country again... And a Hereford steer solves a case for me. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Paul Duboff, Will Wright, 
John Daner, Harry Bartell, Harley Bear, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. An Armed Forces recording of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, from 67 years ago today, September 29th, 1957, The Doubtful Dairy Matter. In just a moment, we'll take a look at a few of the news items from that Sunday, September 29th, 1957, 67 years ago today. There is a defense against radioactive fallout. During enemy attack, get to a shelter immediately. Stay there until local officials advise you it's safe to leave. Be prepared. Planning for emergencies is important, not just nuclear emergencies, but supply chain shortages and all of that. Go to CivilDefenseMuseum.com to get some great information. Our focus today is on Sunday, September 29, 1957. In the newspapers of that Sunday, these are some of the stories that were making headlines. An appeals court yesterday cleared the way for the hotly controversial Teamsters Union election, but warned that convention delegates must be seated in accordance with the Union Constitution. The U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia stayed a temporary injunction granted by Federal Judge F. Dickinson Letta. He had acted to block this week's election at Miami Beach on the plea of that Union bosses, with the aid of criminal elements, had rigged the balloting in favor of James R. Hoffa. President Eisenhower accused uh, Arkansas Governor Orville E. Faubus indirectly yesterday of encouraging mobs of extremists to flout federal court orders on school integration. The president at the same time denied that his order sending federal troops into Little Rock, Arkansas, bore any resemblance to Hitlerian tactics. Eisenhower expressed his views in a telegram to Senator Russell, the Democrat of Georgia, who had protested to the president against what she called high-handed and illegal methods being employed by the federal forces in Little Rock. The telegram did not mention Faubus by name, but in an obvious reference to the Arkansas chief executive, the president said, and we're quoting, When a state, by seeking to frustrate the orders of a federal court, encourages mobs of extremists to flout the orders of a federal court, and when a state refuses to utilize its police powers to protect against mobs persons who are peaceably exercising their rights under the Constitution, as defined in such court orders, the oath of office of the president requires that he take action to give the protection. An armistice was declared yesterday in the Battle of Fort CHS. Central High School had closed its weary doors for the weekend. According to Betty Orinci, the battalion of newsmen transferred operations to the governor's mansion, where 137 Little Rock mothers moved into the spotlight. At an audience with the governor, the mothers put forth their plea for a special session of the legislature, a closing of the school, and a reopening under sponsorship that would remove CHS from federal control and then fell back into the role of typical women. Governor Orville Faubus said yesterday he might seek to close the school rather than to see it continue its integrated classes at the point of federal bayonets. The governor also said he has considered taking legal steps to obtain a federal court injunction against President Eisenhower with the aim of preventing use of federal troops at Little Rock. Adlai Stevenson said yesterday he hopes that the soldiers can be quickly withdrawn from the school integration scene at Little Rock. The twice-defeated presidential candidate who had supported President Eisenhower's decision to send troops to Central High told a news conference the time has come to bind our wounds. At the same time, Stevenson said he felt the national misfortune at Little Rock could have been avoided if President Eisenhower had clearly expressed his opinion earlier. 
Jurors who have deliberated the confidential magazine libel conspiracy case for 11 days reported to the court yesterday that they had not yet taken a formal vote. Superior Judge Herbert V. Walker summoned them to the courtroom to ask how they were progressing. The judge added they were he was not inquiring how they stood as to guilt or innocence, but how they were divided numerically. Foreman said, Your Honor, we have not reached a verdict, we've not finished going through the evidence, and no ballots have been taken. Russia is to publish a five-volume history of World War II, that according to the Moscow Radio. The radio's overseas service said the Communist Party Central Committee will publish the work between now and 1960 under the title The History of the Great Fatherland War of the Soviet Union of 1941 to 1945. A panel of medical experts has reached the conclusion that mass immunization against AV Asian influenza doesn't make sense. The group met Friday night at the request of the San Francisco Medical Society to assess the status of the Asian type virus. Uh, one doctor, Dr. Uh, Rance, declared if we were to give the vaccine to one million persons across the board right now, we would have more deaths and illnesses from the vaccine than we have with the flu. With his number one girl standing at his side, Elvis Presley said, I haven't found any girl I want to marry. Pretty Anita Wood, who Presley recently called his number one girl, blushed. A reporter asked the rock and roll singer if he was engaged. Presley said, not even close. I'm not ready for that. That's not saying I wouldn't if I wanted to. It's just I haven't found any girl I want to marry. Later, a reporter asked Miss Wood what she thought of Elvis's comment on marriage, saying, I don't blame him for saying that. I would have said it too. Though some of the day's top news stories is reported in the newspapers of Sunday, September 29th, 1957. On your radio 67 years ago today, suspense. And that'll be up next here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Government officials suggest that every family store a two-week emergency food and water supply in case of attack. Choose canned or dried foods that can be eaten without cooking. And given the possibility of supply chain shortages, that's still good advice today. All right, uh, we're going to wrap up our look now at uh, September 29th, 1957, 67 years ago today, with an episode of Suspense, Vamp Till Dead, starring Vanessa Brown, a name not widely known today. Uh, Brown worked a lot in radio. Uh, she was, in fact, uh, had an IQ of 165, which put her on the uh, radio show The Quiz Kids. She was born in 1928, so she would be on there. She had an interview program on The Voice of America, Lux Radio Theater, Skippy Hollywood Theater, NBC University Theater, and Theater Guild on the air. She had been in a number of motion pictures, including The Ghost and Mrs. Muir and Big Jack. Uh, Wallace Berry's final movie, and The Heiress and other films. Also, she played uh, Jane in Tarzan and the Slave Girl in 1950. Uh, She was on in television, Robert Montgomery Presents, Philco uh, Television Playhouse, a panelist on Pantomime Quiz, and Leave It to the Girls. Okay, and she had been on The Wonder Years and Murder, she wrote, in her later years. Uh, She passed away in 1999, at the age of 71. Well, let's listen to uh, Vanessa Brown as she acts in this program entitled Vamp Until Den. Dead, an episode of Suspense from 67 years ago today, September 29th, 1957. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. It is a cliché of murder that the killer always returns to the scene of his crime. But we know of no recorded instance in which the victim has returned to the scene of his demise. However, we come as close as we can in the upcoming story. We have contrived to produce a reasonable facsimile of the corpse with some startlingly unpredictable results. Listen... Listen then as Miss Vanessa Brown stars in Vamp Till Dead, which begins in exactly one minute. Do 
you know the Social Security benefits to which you will be entitled when you separate from the service and take a civilian job? Here's a tip from Social Security. Disabled workers at any age up to 65 can now look forward to monthly Social Security benefits. Unfortunately, not all severely disabled workers are aware of the possibility of cash disability benefits for younger workers and their dependents. Illness or accident may strike at any age. Disability, while young, often causes the greatest economic hardship, with a growing family to be cared for. For this reason, Congress has improved Social Security protection against loss of income and offers disability insurance benefits with no age limitations. To find out more about the protection you have under Social Security, write to Social Security, Department 15, Hollywood 28, California. And now... Vamp Till Dead, starring Miss Vanessa Brown. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. <laughs> Your first name, what did you say it was? Amy, Mr. Gentry. Amy Watkins. Amy, Amy, Amy. Yes, yes, yes. And are you a good secretary, Amy? You have all of my recommendations, Mr. Gentry. I mailed them to you a week ago. Oh, yes, 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 to be sure. I must have looked at them or I wouldn't have hired you and had you come all the way from New York, now would I? Do you think you'll like it here in this big house working for me? I hope so, sir. Tell me, what do you think of me? I beg your pardon? Me? How do I strike you? What am I? A gentle person? A wit? A profound talent? A buffoon? Tell me, Amy, I'd be interested in your opinion. Uh, I've only known you a half hour, Mr. Gentry. Well, then I'll tell you. I'm a writer, Amy. Do you know what it means to have a million words inside of you and not to be able to let them out? No, sir. It's an utter horror. And that's the way it's been with me for more than a year. But now I'm ready to go back to work again and release those million words. And it'll be your job to take them down. I'll do my best. Not going to be easy. Very demanding, Amy. I understand, Mr. Gentry. The cook's name is Jenny. She'll help you find your way around the house. And for heaven's sake, call me Paul, not Mr. Gentry. Yes, Paul. That's better. Amy, I feel it helps if, if people adjust to new situations as quickly as possible. Have you heard about my wife? No, sir, I haven't. Well, you will, so I'll tell you. People around here say that I killed Mrs. Gentry. Good night, Amy. <laughs> I ran upstairs to my room. I could still hear him laughing even after I closed the door. And then finally he stopped. And I was lying across my bed when I was aware that someone was standing beside me. He's like that child. You mustn't mind him. Well, uh, who are you? I'm Jenny, the cook. Oh. Oh, yes. Oh, but, but somehow you, you don't, don't look like a cook. Oh, my dear, I find more inspiration in cooking meals for a great writer like Paul Gentry than I ever found in the 23 years I taught high school English. Oh, I see. Now, don't let him upset you. He really doesn't mean it. He can be as gentle as he is harsh. No one really understands him. Did, uh, did, did Mrs. Gentry understand him? No, she didn't. She never made an attempt. There's a question in your eyes, Amy. Yes. Was she murdered? Yes. In that little guest cottage down by the brook, you can see it from this window. How... How... How did it happen? It was almost a year ago. They argued over something trivial at dinner. The flowers on the table. Mrs. Gentry ran out of the house. A few minutes later, I could hear her playing the piano in the cottage. Some little tune that always infuriated him. The next morning, her body was found slumped over the piano. Her neck was broken. And, and people think that There he... was no evidence against Mr. Gentry, no proof. Only hearsay and talk. I see. Now, now there's a question in your eyes. Yes, Amy. 
This information doesn't seem to disturb you. And that puzzles me. Because along with that, there's... There's something about you. What? It's about your appearance, my dear. Really, it's quite remarkable how much you resemble Isabel Gentry. For the next three weeks, I took dictation from morning until night. There was quantity, certainly, but the quality was poor. The book was going badly. And then, one afternoon, when I walked into his study, there was another man standing there beside Paul. <laughs> Amy, Amy, this is Al Pender. Al's a reporter on the local paper. He tried his best to have me indicted for murder. Oh. How do you do, Mr. Pender? I'm glad to meet you, Amy. I've just dropped in to interview Mr. Gentry about his new book. You see, Amy, I'm a celebrity. They interview me about my new book. Why don't you tell him all about it? I, I wouldn't want the responsibility, Paul. You can tell him how bad it is as well as I can. Oh, no, Paul. I couldn't possibly say that about it. What could you say about it? Anything worthwhile? No. The dropped eyes, the withdrawal. Isabel used to react the same way when I became angry with her. Do I... Do I remind you of her? Yes. Yes, you remind me of Isabel. Of all the things in her that stopped me from writing. How do you like that, Pender? There's a story for you to print. You want me to print it, Gentry? I'd kill you if you did. I I'm sorry if I remind you of Isabel, Paul. Are you, Amy? Are you really? No, I don't think you are. I don't think you are at all. Well, has he been like this very long? I'd rather not say, Mr. Pender. Amy... Did you know that no one in town would take this job? Yes. And still you came here? Yes. He killed his wife. Everyone knows it. It was never proved. No, no, because of a technicality. You know, he's right. You do look a great deal like Isabel. And that means you're in danger here. He's crazy. He might actually come to think of you as Isabel. I want him to think of me as Isabel. In every way possible. Every day, every minute. There must be some way to prove he killed her. See, why are you so interested? Who are you, anyway? I'm Isabel Gentry's sister. The second act of... Suspense continues in one minute. This is Johnny Baker with Communism on the Spot. Here's another case that illustrates the worthlessness of Soviet constitutional guarantees. On one Thursday morning in 1940, Soviet workers were told about the change to the eight-hour day and the seven-day week. Just the day before, workers had completed a seven-hour day, part of the five-day week established under the 1936 Constitution. But now they were suddenly required to work 21 extra hours a week. They knew it was impossible for the Constitution to have been amended, since amendments must be approved by the Supreme Soviet, which wasn't even in session. They could, therefore, only conclude that this was another arbitrary violation by the government of a Constitution it held far from sacred. And now... We continue with Act Two of Vamp Till Dead, starring Miss Vanessa Brown. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Yes. I am the sister of the woman Paul Gentry was accused of murdering. I was abroad during their courtship and marriage. We had never met. So it was simple for me to begin my campaign. I began to do everything the way I had remembered Isabel. I wore her favorite perfume. I held my head to one side and smiled the way she used to. I started using her expressions in my speech. I wasn't sure whether I was torturing him or he was torturing himself. But I was certain he began to think of me as Isabel. And then I began visiting the guest cottage where she was murdered and playing the piano at 
which she died. Amy! Oh, I didn't notice you come in, Jenny. What are you doing here in this cottage? Practicing. Must you practice that? What do you mean? That's the tune she used to play. I told you he hated it. Oh, I forgot. And your hair. You're wearing it the way she used to. Am I? Don't you see what you're doing to him? What? He hardly spends an hour a day writing now. It's just like it was when she was alive. There was something about her that killed his inspiration. Instead of creating, he only wanted to destroy. Now you're doing the same thing to him. Me? But I only want to help him. There's only one way you can do that. How? Leave. But he needs me. You're not helping. You're hindering, always reminding him of her. Jenny, why do you stay? Oh, I'm like his desk. Or the chair he sits on, just a piece of furniture doing a job. He doesn't think about me one way or the other. Oh, someday I'll see him get back to writing the way he used to. You mean without her? Yes. Do you think he killed her, Jenny? Oh, that's something I... I don't dare think about, Amy. I thought about it. In the days that followed, Paul's work went from bad to worse, and so did his temper. He was unmanageable most of the time. He would slump in his chair, drinking and staring at me. Just staring. Staring, staring, staring. I knew he was almost ready to break the day he went into a rage and he started throwing things around his study. I left the house, walked down to the guest cottage, sat down at the piano and started to play. Was this it, I wondered? Would the trap be sprung now? I hadn't long to wait. Behind me, I heard the door slowly open and I continued playing first move would have to be his. Hello, Amy. Al? Surprise you? Uh, yes. I brought you something. A gun? What for? Well, if you won't be sensible and leave this place, then you need it for your own protection. I can handle my situation without a gun. Can you? That man is out of his mind. The first time he comes at you, let him have it. Everybody in this town knows about him. Look, no jury would ever convict you. I came here to get proof that Paul Gentry killed my sister. I want him to pay for it legally. But it seems to me that you want me to be judge, jury, and executioner. Oh, now, now listen, Look, Amy. Look, Al, I am going to tell you something. Isabel used to write to me, and, and she was pretty frank. She told me about a newspaper man she was interested in. Could you be that man? Yes. Now, is it because you loved Isabel that you wanted to see her murderer caught? Or would you just like to sacrifice Paul Gentry because he was married to the woman that you wanted? Pender, are you aware that this property belongs to me? What are you doing on it? Talking to her, what does it look like? Paul, Paul, please. How many times do I have to tell you to leave my wife alone? Your wife? Just a minute, You Gentry. get off my property while you can still walk. And Isabel, you get back up to the house where you belong. <laughs> I ran back to the house up to my room A moment later I heard his heavy steps coming up the stairway And before I could do anything He was standing in my doorway Isabel Isabel, why did you make me do it? Why? Why did you do it, Paul? I couldn't help myself with those men all the time, especially Pender. Amy, 
Isabel's dead. You're Amy. Why do you keep making me think that you're Isabel? Why? You're imagining it, Paul. Oh, Amy, why don't you leave here while it's safe? <laughs> I think it is safe, Paul. You aren't afraid of me the way you were that first night? You aren't afraid of what I might do to you? No, Paul, I'm not afraid. If you really want me to go, I will, but I'd rather stay. I want to be close to you. Closer to you than anybody in this world has ever been. Oh, I don't want you to go, Amy. Ever. I love you. I know. I want you to marry me. Of course. Of course, Paul. Ever since Isabel died, I've wanted to be your wife. Act three of Suspense follows in one minute. This is Johnny Baker with Communism on the Spot. The communists insist that Soviet citizens enjoy basic freedoms under their constitution. In theory, the Soviet constitution does promise freedom, civil liberties, and justice under law. These are, however, merely paper guarantees which carry little weight. For the same constitution also declares that these freedoms are to be exercised in conformity with the interests of the working people and in order to strengthen the socialist system. The Communist Party, as the vanguard of the people, decides what these interests are. It interprets the Constitution as it sees fit. It thus turns out that the rules of the party, not the Constitution, are the supreme law of the land. And now... We continue with Act Three of Vamp Till Dead, starring Miss Vanessa Brown. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Next day, we were married quietly by the justice of the peace. Surely this bait would spring the trap. Surely my sister's murderer would attempt to kill the woman who so closely resembled her and now replaced her. That night, I dressed for dinner in the perfect image of my sister. And Paul greeted me as I expected him to. Isabel, you never looked more beautiful. Oh, thank you, Paul. Your chair? Thank you. <laughs> you may serve, Jenny. Yes, sir. Oh, Jenny, use the large soup bowls, please, for Isabel. I understand, sir. I know you prefer them, darling. Um, yes. Is something wrong, Isabel? Uh, Paul, I just noticed... You have carnations on the table. Why, yes. You know I don't like carnations, Paul. I don't like them at all. Isabel, they were all I could get. I'm afraid you'll have to like Look, them. Look, I don't have to like anything. Have Jenny take them off the table. Now, see here. You'll either get rid of them or I won't eat dinner with you. You hear me? Then don't eat dinner with me, my dear. I'd like it better that way. And I won't have to look at your bored, critical face all the time. <laughs> It was rude and cruel, but I had to know. I had to act the same way Isabel had acted, for it was just a year ago tonight that she had been murdered. And then I was in the cottage, where it had happened, sitting at the piano, playing her tune. I sat there waiting. I knew I would hear steps first, and then a door. But I heard nothing. Nothing. And then at last, I heard the steps. Hey, 
Amy. Amy, are you all right? Are you all right, yes. Amy? Yes, Sal. Yes. Yes. Bender, uh, stay where you are or I'll blow your head off. I always knew it was you who killed Isabel. Are you? Because she refused to run away with you. Are you wrong, Gentry? It wasn't no. me. Look. Paul. Paul, darling. She was the one. Jenny. Jenny. I had to knock her out. She tried to kill Amy the same way she killed Isabel. She was afraid Amy was going to take you away from her. Oh, Amy, Amy, my darling. Paul, do you, do you know who I am? Who I really am? Yes, I know you're not Isabel. I've known all along. I had to pretend because you pretended. Forgive me, please forgive me. It's all over, my darling. Ended. Yes, yes, Paul, it's over. Isabel is truly dead. <laughs> Suspense. In which Miss Vanessa Brown starred in Vamp Till Dead. Written by E. Jack Newman and John Michael Hayes. Suspense is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. In a moment, the names of tonight's players. This is Johnny Baker with Communism on the Spot. A few words now on the position of the family under communism. In Soviet society, the family has been reduced to a kind of machine for producing workers. Soviet leaders have deprived families of the right to educate their children and have minimized the influence of family life by drawing women into the labor force. The institution of the family is looked on as part of the machinery for producing what are designated as obedient, disciplined communists. To accomplish this, the role of the parents has been taken over by the schools, by youth organizations, and by the establishment of boarding schools. The final aim of the party is evidently the education of all children away from the family. Supporting Miss Vanessa Brown in Vamp Till Dead were Jeanette Nolan, Ben Wright, and Norm Alden. Listen. Listen again next week when we bring you Jack Carson starring in Misfire, another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. With that Armed Forces recording of Suspense, Vamp Till Dead, starring Vanessa Brown, we bring to a close our look at September 29th, 1957. Tomorrow on Classic Radio Theater, we take a look back at the final days of old-time radio with the final episodes of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Suspense from 62 years ago tomorrow, September 30th, 1962. And then we will have an episode of Gunsmoke and Port Laramie from September 30th, 1956. And we'll have news from both those days as well, along with an episode of Claudia. Uh, And uh, coming up later this week, we'll have Dragnet, Escape, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, Boston Blackie, Gangbusters, Casey Crime Photographer, Have Gun Will Travel, and Gunsmoke again, and Lum and Abner in their half hour show, Phil Harris and Alice Spay, uh, Jack Benny, and Burns and Allen. That's all coming up later on this week. Right now, we're going to get uh, take a quick break and get to an episode of Counter Spy. Every family should have a home shelter area. Every family should stock that shelter area with a two-week supply of food and water. Prepare now to survive disaster. There are plans for do-it-yourself home shelters at CivilDefenseMuseum.com. Don McLaughlin, Mandel Kramer, an episode of Counter Spy, as it was broadcast on ABC 75 years ago, September 29th, 1949, in the case of The Vicious Visitor. Pepsi-Cola, P-E-P-S-I, that's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi-Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington, Colorado. 
calling David Harding, counter spy. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. <laughs> Counterspies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of the vicious visitor. Another counter spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12 ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi is America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi's best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, to Counter Spy. A penitentiary, its high, thick walls looming black in the darkness. Inside, a sudden flood of searchlights illuminates every corner. Gates clang shut. And a siren wails frighteningly into the night. Attention! Attention all posts! Special alert! Block all exits! This is Warden Dean. Prisoner 196523, Rocky Gaines. Escaped from prison workshop three minutes ago. Block all exits! And be careful! Gaines is armed! He's a psychotic murderer and will shoot to kill. You made it, Rocky. Yeah, I'll admit it. You got the clothes? Yeah, in the car. All right. And change on the way. Yeah, right. we're getting close. Come on, let's get going. Oh, it's fagged out, Al. Where's that car? Right where I said it'd be, Rocky. Yeah? The road cuts through this swamp just a few feet ahead. The roads are getting closer, Rocky. I got this far, Al. I'll get the rest of the way. I hope. There's the car. That's is in the back seat. You can change one. Uh, what? Rocky, I'm hit. Oh. A couple of oh. shots might hold him off a minute. Oh. Al, come on, get in the back. I, Quick. I can't move. Let... All right, come on, I'll help you in. Oh, come on. <laughs> Give up. Rocky, you ain't got a chance. Give up. No chance, huh? I got this far. You watch me get the rest of the way. To David Harding, Chief United States Counter Spies, Washington. From Warden Deems, Alderlander Federal Penitentiary, Maxton City. Rocky Gaines, serving time here for armed bank robbery, made successful break 5 p.m. this date. After gun battle with prison search squad in nearby swamp, Gaines and unidentified companion made getaway in black Buick sedan. Rocky, where you driving it? We gotta ditch this car, Al. These woods are as good a spot as any. Rocky, them bumps! Every time you hit a bump, it kills me. I'm all shot up. Oh, they got more than one would do. You don't hear me yapping, do you? Hurt, Rocky. I just hurt. Yeah. Oh. Okay, we'll leave the jalopy here. Come on, Al. Get out of that back seat. I can't. Out, I said. We gotta keep moving. Yeah, Rocky, I swear. It's down to my legs. I can't move. Rocky, I'll wait here for you. What do you mean, wait? You've got to get me a doc, Rocky. Please, 
Rocky, if that's the only one that can help oh, me. Oh, sure, sure. Doc, I'll say, come with me and help my pal. He got shot helping me break out of the pen. Sure, you come running. You gotta do something. I can't take it. It's like a fire inside of me. You're my pal. You gotta do something. Okay, Al, I'll do something for you. Rocky, that's gun. What's the idea? I told you I'd do something, didn't I? This will put you out of your misery. Rocky, don't. You're gonna die anyway. I'm doing you a Rocky, favor. Don't pull that trigger. So long, Al. Wait, See wait. you around. Rocky, I... Washington to Conway, Albany. Identification reports that fingerprints of the dead man are those of Alvin Troy, alias Al Trojan, formerly a sidekick of Rocky Gaines. We're working on blood samples you forwarded in the laboratory. How's it coming, Dr. Lowe? Well, I've finished the blood test, Mr. Harding. And? I'll have a look. Uh, this microscope first. Uh-huh. Now, that's a specimen of the blood we found in the rear seat of the getaway car. Type O. The dead man, Al Trojan, had type O. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, look at the specimen under this other microscope. See, that's a smear we got from the front seat of the car. That's different. <laughs> it certainly is. Type B blood. Which means that the man driving the getaway car was Rocky Gaines. And he must have been wounded by the prison guards, too. Undoubtedly. Well, Dr. Lawton, when the other reports are completed, let me know. Uh-huh. I'll be back in my office with Harry Peters. And the lab test Peters proved that the blood stains on the front and rear seats of the car were of different types. Now, what did ballistics dig up about the bullets in Trojan's body? Something even more interesting, Dave. Of the five slugs probed out of Al Trojan's body, only two were thirty caliber. The other three were forty fives. What? Yes, sir. And the prison guards used thirty caliber rifles. And we know that Rocky Gaines was armed with a revolver, undoubtedly a forty five. Nice boy, Rocky Gaines. Yes, this means he murdered his own partner. Rocky must have figured that Al Trojan wounded was a dead weight on his hands. And dead men tell no tales, especially to the police. Well, from all we know about Gaines, this doesn't surprise me, Peter. According to the prison report, Gaines is a psychotic, triggered finger type, a purely emotionless killer without normal human conscience. Special coming in on the radio, Dave. Harding, go ahead. Conway, Mr. Harding. I'm in Tannersville. I got a lead on Rocky Gaines. Let's have it. Less than an hour ago, a motorist picked up a hitchhiker on a back road 20 miles from here. And then at gunpoint, the driver was forced out of his car and left high and dry. The driver identifies the hitchhiker as Rocky Gaines? Positively. What direction did he drive off? North. All right, Conway. From now on, we'll use Tannersville as the focal point of our operations. Set up an emergency base for us there. Right, Chief. Why Tannersville, Dave? Look at this map, Peters. Here's Tannersville. The last large town this side of those mountains. Now, you heard, Conway, Rocky was driving north. Which means he's probably headed into the mountains, hmm? Right. Now, with the local police, we'll set up blocks at every intersection of those mountain roads. Rocky may get into those mountains, but he has at least one bullet wound. Sooner or later, he'll have to get help up there, or come out for it. And when he does, we'll have to be close by, or some innocent people may get killed. Boat engine sounds kind of peculiar to me. Oh, Cliff, there isn't a thing wrong with a boat, and you know it. Well, it still sounds funny. I can't put my finger now, on it. Now, darling, telephone. you're just looking for another excuse to take the motor apart again. Now, isn't that it? Trouble with you, Mrs. Benton, is you know too darn much about me. <laughs> well, now, imagine a husband admitting that. Hey, you're running us right into the kitty. Oh, oh, I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
All right, now bring it in easy. Yeah. That's it. Okay, kill the motor. Huh? This is a nice landing. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything especially want in town, Norma? Uh, no. I... Oh, yes, yes, Cliff. Will you stop by Jane Tompkins and ask if she heard anything about that material I ordered? Jane Tompkins material. Anything else? Not a thing. I'll be back to pick you up here at 12. All right, honey. Here at the jetty at 12. Bye. <sighs> Nice coat you got there, lady. Oh. Oh, thanks. My husband takes a lot of pride in it. Looks like things turned out okay for you, Norma. What? What's the matter, Norma? Don't you remember me? An old friend like me? Take another look. Lucky day. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long time, huh, baby? How many years? Fifteen? Still don't look a day over twenty. What are you doing here? You don't look so glad to see your old friend Rocky. You and me used to get along swell in the old days, remember? Norma and Rocky? <laughs> Quite a pair. What do you want, Rocky? For old time's sake, baby, just a little favor. What kind of a favor? I happen to be in the neighborhood, and I remember hearing that after you left town, you come up here and married yourself a square. Some guy who runs duck hunting blinds out on that island in the lake. Yes, we live there, Cliff and I. I figured that island's just about the right place for me to lay low a while to a heat up. What do you say, Norma, baby? For old time's sake? I'm sorry, Rocky. I got a slug in my shoulder. I need a doc to take care of it. I got a healthy wad of dough. You'll get nice room and board. No, I won't do it, Rocky. I can't. I'll... I'll just pretend that you weren't here. But I didn't see you. You pretend, huh? It's the best I can do, Rocky. The best you can do? Now, you listen to me. I'm wise to your setup, baby. Nobody around here is supposed to know what you were before you came here. You're a nice, sweet lily of the valley in these parts, Rocky, huh? I've changed. I'm different. Norma, baby. That character Cliff who got out of that boat a few minutes ago. He too looked awful happy from where I was going. Ever tell your husband about the old days, Norma? About yourself and Rocky Gaines? <laughs> no, I guess you didn't. Now, you wouldn't want to spoil everything that makes Mr. Benton unhappy, would you? Of all the places in the world, why did you have to come here? Ah, baby, I knew you'd come through for an old friend. Oh. Now, after you take me over to your island, you call the town doctor and tell him there was a gun accident. But Cliff, what will I tell Cliff? Let's tell your husband that an old friend named uh, Steve Evans is staying for a visit. Now turn that motor over, baby. Let's get out to that island fast. Go ahead. This is Conway, Mr. Harding. We've just located a car stolen by Rocky Gaines, lying at the bottom of a ravine, completely wrecked. What about Rocky? No trace of him, Chief. What's the location, Conway? Uh, just off a dirt road called Elder Lane, nine miles south of Crystal Lake. All right, Conway, we'll head that way. Better step on it, Chief. Right, Dave. We'll have to turn on to Route 16A for Crystal Lake. Crystal Lake. It means Rocky's still moving north. Yeah. Without a car, he's going to be slowed down. Dave, now we can start closing in on Rocky Gaines from all sides. Yes, and let's hope we get him before any innocent bystanders excite his murder-mad mind. In just a moment, we'll return to Counter Spy. Brought to you by Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola, it's the spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question. Why take less when Pepsi's best? No budget, no allowance, ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi-Cola. Because one big 12-ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste. Twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi's best? Yes, families like yours and mine, families all over America, they're all saying, why take less when Pepsi's best? Pepsi Cola hits the spot, tastes terrific when you're hot, more and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Today, tomorrow, always. Get America's biggest total value. 
Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? Now, back to Counterspy. David Harding and his assistant, Harry Peters, looking for the escaped federal prisoner and murderer, Rocky Gaines, are now in the office of a Dr. Raymond Vincent in the town of Greendale on the shore of Crystal Lake. Dr. Vincent, this is my assistant, Harry Peters. How do you do, Mr. Peters? Dr. Vincent. Well, now, if you will tell us the story, Doctor. Well, of course, Mr. Harding, it can't have any bearing on your case, but that man of yours who stopped by here was so dead set in my telling you. Well, please go ahead, Doctor. Well, it was like this. Now, yesterday morning, the phone rings. It's uh, Norma Benton, place over on Mallard Island. Mallard Island? Uh, that's a big island a few miles out in the lake. It's called Mallard on account it's a dandy spot for duck hunters. Matter of fact, the best town spot in the state Cliff Benton and his wife, Norma, the only ones who live on Mallard. Cliff keeps the duck blinds in repair. County pays for it, you know. It brings business uh, Well, Doctor, what about Mrs. Benton's telephone call? Well, it seems Norma Benton's got a friend that came to visit. Uh, friend's name is, um... Uh, no, it wasn't it. Uh, I have it here on a card. It... Evans, that's what it is. Steve, Steve Evans. Steve Evans. And then, Doctor... Well, it seems Norma was showing this Steve Evans fellow some of Cliff's guns. And one of the darn things goes off, and this friend is shot right smack in the shoulder. You have quite a few accidents like that up here. You know, you've got to be careful with firearms. Uh, Doctor, do you have the bullet you extracted? Well, you usually do, you know. But this friend of Norma Benton's, uh, what in tarnation was his name? I'm, well, I got it here on a card. Evans. And Steve Evans. That's it, Evans, yeah. You've got a good memory, son. Well, this Steve Evans tells me he'd like to keep the bullet for a souvenir of his visit to Crystal Lake. Some folks are kind of funny that way, you know. I once knew a well, fellow... Well, Doctor, he... we won't take up any more huh? of your time. Thank you very much. Well, you're entirely welcome. I suppose I wasn't of much help to you, though. Well, you never can tell, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye, gentlemen. What do you think, Dave? I'll bet you my pension that the Benton's visitor is Rocky Gaines. Hop in, Peter. Yeah. Harding to Conway in master control car. Conway to Harding, standing by. Believe we've located Rocky Gaines on Mallard Island in Crystal Lake. Have all mobile squads in area report to me at Lake Shore Town of Greendale. That is all. The wind-up, Dave? Well, not just yet, Peter. I'm interested in Norma and Cliff Benton. Well, why should they protect and harbor a criminal? I suppose they don't know who he really is? Well, in that case, those two are in terrible danger. Rocky Gaines is a pathological killer. If we make any hasty move, he might murder them. That's true. Well, on the other hand, the doctor told us that... Uh, Steve Evans was an old friend of Mrs. Norma Benton. Peters, before we close in on Mallard Island, I want a complete checkup on Norma Benton. Then we'll know how to handle this capture. Well, dinner, Mrs. Benton. Norma's my favorite cook, Mr. Evans. Uh, you're lucky to have a wife like her. Yes, don't I know it. But Norma, dear, you, you haven't said a word all evening. Is there something wrong? No. You, uh, you hardly ate anything, dear. I wasn't very hungry, Cliff. Oh, something on your mind, maybe, Mrs. Benton? No, there is nothing on my mind. Norma, dear, something is bothering me. Now, you, you haven't been all right for the past few days. Well, what is it, dear? I'm all right, Cliff. How many times do I have to tell you I'm perfectly all right? Now, let me alone. Norma, wait. I, I... just want to be let alone. Norma! Well, it looks like uh, I maybe started something, Mr. Benton. No, no, it, uh, it's not your fault, Mr. Evans. Only I, I... I can't understand what's gotten into She uh, She was always so happy here, you know, on the island... Such a safe, peaceful place. Yeah, Mr. Benton. This island's about the safest place I've ever been in my life. All right, 
night, Scott. Thanks very much. Peters, did you get all that on the extension? All of it, Dave. This is Norma Benton, formerly Norma Marks, the entertainer at the Black Grotto in Bayside from 1931 to 1934. An old flame of Rocky Games. That undoubtedly means Mrs. Benton is giving help to Rocky. Yes, Peters. She's hiding him. Now we know how to handle this. This is Norma Benton? Yes, I'm Norma Benton. What is it? I've been waiting for you to come over here from the island. But uh, who are you? Agent Harry Peters, United States Counter Spies. Come with me, please. And that's the story, Mr. Hardy. Rocky Gaines forced himself on me. I, I had to take him. You had to? Why? Because I didn't want Cliff, that's my husband, to find out what I was once. I didn't want to hurt him. I see. Can you understand what I mean, Mr. Hardy? Well, yes, Mrs. Benton, but there are a great many people like you who make the same mistake. Once you were in a bad crowd, but at least you had the sense to get out. You've nothing to be ashamed of. Some people don't see it that way. The right people do, Mrs. Benton. And from everything I know about your husband, he's certainly one of the right people. I was crazy to help Rocky, I know. If I had come to you in the beginning, Cliff wouldn't be in such danger now. Danger? What do you mean, Mrs. Benton? Rocky warned me not to let Cliff leave the island until after he's gone. He keeps his eye on Cliff all the time. Follows him, never lets Cliff out of his sight. And Rocky always has that gun with him. He told me that if anything goes wrong, if I make just one slip, he'll kill Cliff. Hello? Hello, Mr. Harding. This is Cliff Benton. Cliff Benton, yes. Norma's not in the house now, but she told me about your talk with her. Rocky Gaines finally went to sleep. I just checked to make sure. All right. Peters and I'll start for your island right away. All right. The moorings on the south shore. I know. We should be there in less than 20 minutes. I'll be waiting for you, Mr. Hardy. You'll be waiting, huh, Benton? Gaines. Oh, Norma, what had happened if either of you tried playing games with me? You should have left my wife alone. You... I knew her long before you did, you... James, don't hit me again. All you and Norma had to do was keep your traps tight till I got away. What did you have to squeal for? The counter spies found out themselves, Gaines. You're licked now. They're on their way here. And you think I'm going to sit here like one of those dumb ducks of yours, huh? Well, I can play games, too, Ben, with red-hot slugs for you and for Norma. Wait, game. Wait, yeah, don't worry, I'll wait. Till Harding gets here, and then I start. Ballard Island, just ahead, Dave. Make for the jetty on the south side, Peter. Right. Peter, what? Through the trees, that light. Right? Right in the center of the island. Over there. I see it. That's the attic light in the Benton house. Norma Benton's danger signal to us. Something must have gone haywire. Maybe Rocky tumbled to the plan. Let's get to shore. Right. I'll make it fast. Mr. Harding. Mr. Harding. Mrs. Benton, Dave. Mr. Harding, did you see the attic signal? Yes. Last I heard it from your husband. What happened? I was outside the room when Cliff called you. Rocky caught him at it, so I switched on the signal light in the attic and ran down here. You go right up to the house. Yes, but Mr. Harding, Rocky plans to kill us all. Cliff, me, and you. He's waiting for you to arrive. But if he finds out that I'm gone, he won't wait. He has Cliff in the living room. Peter. Yes, Dave. We'll have to improvise fast. Now, you circle around the house. I'll have to take a chance of going up the front way with Mrs. Benton. There's a back door to the living room, isn't there, Mrs. Benton? Yes. Okay, Peters. You come in through the back. I'll try to stall Rocky Gaines while I jockey him into position. Now, your cue to come in will be will be this sentence. Don't be a fool, Rocky. You got it? Don't be a fool, Rocky. I'll set on it, Dave. I better get a shot, Dave. Cliff! Let me kill Cliff! Mrs. Benton, wait! Don't go back there alone! Wait! Cliff! 
Thank heaven it was. Those shots, Mr. Benton. What happened? Where's Rocky Gaines? Right here, Harding. <laughs> Behind. <sighs> Get your hands up, Harding. You and Benton both. That's it. Now keep them that way. By the way, Harding, where are all your boys? I saw you come up the path alone. I came over alone, Gaines, to talk sense to you. Yeah? What kind of sense? Give yourself up, Rocky. You haven't got a chance of getting away from this place alive. <laughs> Look who's telling me about getting out alive. There are counter spies stationed all along the shore. Don't be a fool, Rocky. Fool, huh? I got out of tougher spots than this. After I set this house on fire, your Boy Scouts will all come over here on the double. That's when I make my break with the boat. I told you before, you haven't got a chance in the world. Don't be a fool, Rocky. Shut up. You're holding up this party, and at this party, Harding, you're the guest of honor. And like they say, the guest of honor should get the first helping. <laughs> Postman for you, Dave. Oh, you're telling me, Peters. What happened to you? I said the signal sentence twice, Dave. Believe it or not, those woods out back are thicker than we figured. It took me a while to get through. It's a good thing they weren't any thicker. All right, Mrs. Benton. A little shaky, but yes, all right. This cook is. We're both very grateful to you, Mr. Harding, for saving our lives and our life together. Well, it cost Rocky Gaines his life. And that closes the case of your vicious visitor. When your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... This is David Harding again. A special word to employers. Give work to our handicapped veterans. Next time a job opens, write to Captain Maurice Witherspoon. Masonic Veterans Committee, 71 West 23rd Street, New York City. Give our fighting men a fighting chance for rehabilitation. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station to Counter Spy. Listen next Tuesday for the exciting Counter Spy case of the sweepstake murders. When frightened witnesses could gasp only murdered by a golden sword. When strange and eerie sounds came from the depths of a ship. When a man had to be shot at to make him talk. These were some of the elements your Counter Spies faced in our next case. Tune in on Tuesday to Case. Of the Sweet State Murders on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by William M. Sweet, dramatized by Edward J. Adamson, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer, with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter Spy is a Philip H. Lord production for Pepsi Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. Seventy-five years ago today, September 29th, 1949, Counter Spy here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Up next, an episode of Gangbusters. Should public utilities fail in time of disaster, refrigerated foods must be either cooked or eaten before they spoil. If this can't be done, throw it away. That applies to today. It didn't necessarily have to be a, a, a nuclear disaster. Let's go back 79 years, September 29, 1945. In the case of the escape artist, Gangbusters. Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, 
the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. resigned as commissioner of the largest police department in the world, takes over for gangbusters to interview by proxy Chief of Police Hans Halverson of Ray, North Dakota. Commissioner Valentine. Now, Chief Halverson, the official police reports show that John K. Giles was an exceptionally cunning criminal. And uh, deadly, Commissioner Valentine. So you're going to start tonight's case back at Leech Lake. In Minnesota. Yes. There was a tall, wealthy sportsman, a Mr. George William Stubblefield. He had one of the fashionable cottages with a Mr. Barton. And they were there for some bass fishing. Now, in that same section was reported to be the super criminal John K. Giles, like lightning with a gun. At 10.30, in the evening of September 2nd, Mr. Stubblefield and Mr. Barton were in their cabin, alone, looking over their bass fishing equipment. I think I'll try my double spinner with a bucktail streamer tomorrow, Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah? Well, let me see it. The water is pretty warm in the lake, and I think the bass are down pretty deep. It's here somewhere. Uh, get those hands up. Both of you. Get those hands up or I'll shoot. Well, we have company. I know you're both rich and you're alone out here in this cabin. I guess he means it too, Mr. Stubblefield. Young man, don't you realize that crime doesn't pay? Uh, I don't want any sermons. I want cash. Well, it so happens we have our hands in the air. Very little money grows on ceilings. All right. You first. Me? Yeah, you the name is Stubblefield. All right. Uh, lower your right hand and pick out everything there is in your pocket and drop it on the floor. It'll get all dirty. Do as I told you. All right. All right. But I only have a hundred or two in my pocket. There's some. And here's some more. I wouldn't try to pick that gun up. Don't you anymore. Hey, don't. Look. Look. My hand. I told you, young man. Crime doesn't pay. The easiest thing to do, Stubb, would be to put a bullet through the back of his head and drop him into the lake. Hey, no, no. You can't do that. Hey, let me go, will you? Say, you don't suppose he's that famous gunman they say might be around this section? That John K. Giles? Oh, I doubt it. No. Hey, no. I'm not... Hey, I'm not Giles. Oh, I just pull little stuff. All right. I'm going to count to three. If you're still around... One... Two. <laughs> Streak of lightning. <laughs> oh, that's the best show I've had in weeks. If he only knew, he tried to hold up the famous John K. Giles himself. Yeah, he ought to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. You know, Barton, the feel of this gun in my hands. Well, thanks, Charles. Yeah. The one I've been planning. The bank at Ray, North Dakota. But what's the matter with what we're doing now? Two wealthy fishermen, the bass are biting good. You've got three rich dames here crazy about you. <laughs> There's plenty of women and plenty of bass other places. Start packing up, Barton. This little gun, and you and me, are going to pay a visit to Ray, North Dakota. I didn't figure this Ray, North Dakota, would be such a busy place, Charles. You ready? We'll take a little walk into the bank. Okay. Wait a minute. Don't turn around. Somebody's walking up and back here. Who is it? Johnson, the chief of police. I checked on the police earlier this morning, and I'm sure. I saw you two men standing here. I was wondering if you wanted anything special. Well, that's nice of you. We're strangers in town. Well, what's on your mind? Well, we heard there was some good bass fishing around. If we could find a place to stay. Well, there are a couple of good hotels. Now, my name is Stubblefield. This is Mr. Barton. Howdy. Howdy. I happen to be the chief here, Chief Johnson. 
Uh, there's a good hotel right down the street. Where? Well, you go down there to the third street, and then you take a... He knew who we were all the time. He's not dead. Mm. Now, come on. Beat it to the car. Instead of this bank, I know a couple of other jobs we can pull. Then we'll separate until the heat's off. Hop him. Hey, haven't you got any nerves at all, now? Uh, not at a time like this. Well, after we separate, what then? We'll meet again in Nevada. At Reno. Barton, come on up. I'll be right there. Hmm. Hello? Don't you ever stay in your room? Oh, hello, Mrs. Walton. I told you to call me Betty. I'm giving a cocktail party this afternoon. You've got to come. Well, I'd love to, but I'm playing golf with Mrs. Wood. Oh, that's a shame. Getting so the divorcees around here won't go to a cocktail party if you aren't going to be there. Well, that's very flattering, but I'll tell you what. I'll see you at the roulette table tonight. You will. Will you drive me home afterwards? Hey, what a swanky joint. Oh, somebody just come in? My butler. Oh, you lucky thing to have a butler. Well, now I'm one of them things. I'll remember. Tonight at the roulette table. Bye, my dear. I'll be there. Don't you dare forget. I won't. Goodbye. So now I'm your butler, huh? Oh, sit down, Barton. Yeah, things have been pretty rosy since I saw you last. Really? What have you got lined up? About ten divorces for a relaxation. And the gambling casino for us to take over. Mm-hmm. Say, how about a little first question, huh? Champagne? Oh, no, no, no. It gives me a head the next day unless I drink a lot of milk before I go to bed. And milk's making me fat. <laughs> a slug arrived. I got a whole closet full. I just got in the room myself, as you called. Get my hands up, Giles. You too, Barton. Well, police popping out of liquor closets. Police popping out of bathrooms. Any more under the bed? Cuffs on both of them. Yeah. Oh, oh, right 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 right. Right. A nice reception I get, Giles. Don't worry, Barton. We'll get a little rest for a few days. Then we'll break out of whatever they put us into. Pretty cocky, aren't you, Giles? As cocky as you cops are lucky. No, it wasn't luck, Giles. After you killed Chief Johnson in Ray, North Dakota, you robbed the First National Bank of Genoa. Then you hired a private plane to bring you from Salt Lake City here to Reno. <laughs> well, huh. where do we go from here? You're going back to Iowa. You've escaped from every prison you ever put into, Giles. But you ever hear of the specially built Potawatomi prison? Hey, that's quite a name, isn't it? The Potawatomi... Oh, never mind. I'll be out of it before I can pronounce it. And so, Commissioner Valentine, cop killer and escape artist John K. Giles was headed for prison. But we've just started our case. Well, Chief Halverson, we certainly want to hear what happened next. Now, back to tonight's gangbusters case of John K. Giles and Commissioner Lewis J. Valentine. Now, Chief Halverson, cop killer John K. Giles was headed for prison. And Commissioner Valentine, Potawatomi Prison in Iowa was the last word in prison. Giles and Barton were being ushered through the prison corridor. Now, this will be your cell, Giles. And Barton. Quite an iron box, this, isn't it? You're quite an escape artist, Giles. That's why a special cell like this was built for guys like you. You see, it's built on a turntable made of steel. There's only one door to it. The floor is steel. 
Well, in fact, you might try it out with a hacksaw blade. I would, if we had one. Use the one you have hidden in the heel of your shoe. Oh. Hmm. Well, I guess we've got us this time, Giles. All right. Seeing you know I've got a hacksaw blade, I'll try it just for fun. When you go through a door and have metal on you, it signals. Doesn't bite in, does it, Giles? Quite amusing. Another thing, Giles. All we allow you is bunk blankets, overalls, and his living implements, toothbrushes, paper cups and plates, and wooden spoons. Oh, that's perfectly all right. That's enough for me to escape with. Oh, cut it out, will you, child? Now, if you two will step into your cell. What do you think of it, child? Well, personally, but of course, it's just my own opinion. I think it stinks. Speak and take it on the earphones while I take his call. Hello? How long before you come home, Walter? Well, I probably won't even be home tonight, dear. Oh, why not? Well, I'm in a little room in the basement under the special cell. We're determined that Giles isn't going to escape. But Giles is a de escape proof cell. He couldn't escape out of that cell. Well, this Giles is superhuman. We're not taking any chances. We've well, got a microphone hidden in the wall. And one of us stays down here by the speaker every second. Are they still plotting to escape? Giles can think up two new ways every ten minutes. We let them go ahead and then stop them just about as they start something. Walter. Hmm? The baby's got a new tooth. No kidding. That's what I wanted to tell you. Oh, that's swell. Uh, I'll call you back, darling. I've got to listen to Giles and Barton. All right, Joe. Put your back. Killing the guard is out. Maybe somehow we can get into a fight. Be badly hurt. Uh, even then, I don't think they'd let us out of this cell. Oh, I'm going to turn in, Charles. I'm all in. My brain won't work. <laughs> That's where my brain starts to work the best. I don't want to stay cooped up in this cell the rest of my life. All right, go to sleep. Let me do the thinking. Uh, I wish I'd been a Sunday school teacher. What's the matter, Barton? Think you're dreaming? Huh? You all finished? Sure. Say, you done stir crazy, Charles? What? What's the matter? You thought I was asleep, didn't you? But I've been watching you for an hour, putting water through that little hole in the wall. <laughs> no savvy? What's the guy? The cops have got a microphone in the wall. What? They've been listening for days to every word we've said. How do you know? I sounded the wall. Well, why didn't you tell me? I wouldn't have said some of the things I did. I wanted you to talk just like you didn't know. You were making up all those crackpot ideas to escape. You kept them busy. Their minds occupied. Well, I was doing some special thinking to myself. Yeah, but why the water? Can't they hear us now? Water short circuits wires, Barton. That's what I've been pouring it through this little hole in the wall for. They'll think just something has gone wrong with the amplifier. While they're sending for a radio repairman, we'll do our real planning. Have you thought of something? We're going to start out of here in about two minutes. Now listen, you wouldn't kid me. You wouldn't kid me. You'd love that. We didn't have anything to work with. But I made something. I chewed up part of a paper plate till it was a pulp. Yeah? Then I chewed up a few cigarette papers. And using that as a plastic, I pushed it into the cell lock here. And I got an impression of the lock. Holy smokes, but what good will that do? Then I used both of our toothbrushes. By rubbing them on the sharp corners of the cell, I shaped them with the right notches and curves. And those brush handles will unlock the lock. Oh, you're crazy, Charles. It wouldn't be possible. Then you stay here. I'm leaving. Just outside in the garage is a blue police car. The door of the garage is steel. But if the car hits it hard enough... I think it'll give. I don't know whether I'm awake or dreaming. Here. Here's the toothbrush handle. Let's get started. If you can open that big cell lock with that rig, 
Ah, it can't be done, Doc. Quick, it's open. Holy smokes, I'm faint. Come on. So you come out of the movies. How'd you like it? Well, not bad. You haven't got a bad little town here. Mr. Concord, New Hampshire, don't take second place to any town. You know, there's a lot of excitement in town today. Yeah, why? That criminal, Giles, you know, in the papers. Yeah? They found the car he'd been driving in town in a parking lot last night. They sent him to the arm. Yeah, okay, bud. Don't Glad move to... a muscle, Giles. There are four officers who've come up behind you with submachine guns. They'll cut you in two. So that was the store, huh? And I fell for it. Yeah. And we have your pal Cook, too. Remember, boys, this guy killed one chief of police without giving him a chance. sea breeze out here, Dodd. Well, Giles, you're supposed to be an escape artist. But never since Alcatraz was built has a man successfully escaped. Not yet, huh? Not yet. It's two miles to the coast of California. The tides run eight miles an hour and can't be swum. The prisoners are not allowed to talk to each other. The prisoners are counted every 30 minutes. Oh, you guys here can count, huh? You're assigned to the laundry. Pressing clothes. We're doing the laundry for the army now. And besides, Giles, a cop killer isn't very welcome at Alcatraz. All right, men. Start marching to your assigned places. Talk to anybody. Eng? Yeah. They made a mistake by letting me help load the wash into the army boat with the docks. Mm-hmm. The guy could get a GI outfit. Pants, shirt, belt, and socks. He might slip on board the boat when it's leaving. Yeah. But you can't steal an outfit all at once. You gotta be patient. A year, maybe. Yeah, one thing at a time. Hide in the dock, and everything must fit me exactly, or I'd be noticed when I go on board. Yeah. Cast them off. 
Got all aboard, you boys? That's uh, all aboard, Sergeant. Fine. I'm going aboard, then. Get off the boys! Yeah, they're sailing right off, huh? As soon as we get the gangway up, Sergeant. Nah, it's a stuff. Every trip, the sooner we can get away from this Alcatraz dock, the better I like it. What's the matter, Sergeant? Cold? No, no, I just... Just thought I'd sit down here behind the lifeboat. Take a little rest. That's quite a sight, isn't it? Alcatraz fading in the distance. Yeah. I hate that dump. Some of those guys in there are pretty tough babies, huh? Yeah. I guess a fella in there has a pretty helpless feeling. Did nobody ever escape. Yeah. Not like sitting out here with the wind and the sea. Yeah. This is great. Orders have just come through. There's some trouble. Yeah? I just came from the radio house. They just made their 30 minute count at Alcatraz, and one of them cards is missing. Holy smokes. A fellow by the name of Giles. He's a cop killer. Hey, wait a minute. You mean radio says one of them Alcatraz guys is on our ship? Yeah, a fairly tall guy. Good looking. They're going to start a search. Oh, look, guys. If there's a killer like that on the ship, what'll they do? They're swinging now, see? We're starting to head back to the rock. Heading back to the rock? Yeah. What's the matter? You seasick? Yeah, I guess I'll go over to the rail. What's the matter with him? You notice how he acted? I don't think he's seasick. Hey, I'll bet you. I don't recognize him. I'll bet you. Hey, he's starting to climb the rail. That's Giles. Sure, he's going to commit suicide. Come on, let's rush him. Well, Giles, okay. Okay, you got me. I'm through. I'm washed up. Yeah, washed up. For keeps. I'll go back to the rock. And die there. <laughs> Giles attempted that escape less than two months ago, Commissioner Valentine. July 31st. And I understand, Chief Halverson, that his failure broke him. He's no longer the escape artist, but a, but a broken wreck of a man. Yes, Commissioner. John K. Giles has no more spirit left. You might call him a, a walking dead man behind those massive walls of Alcatraz. Well, Chief Halverson... This has been a terrific case and just proves again that crime cannot pay. For next week, same time, same station, listen to Gangbusters. 79 years ago, September 29th, 1945, Gangbusters on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Tomorrow, the final shows of the Golden Age of Radio with the final episodes of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Suspense. From uh, Sunday, September 30th, 1962. And a couple of great westerns from this date back in 1956. Uh, an episode of Gunsmoke and Fort Laramie. And we'll hear Claudia as well tomorrow. But right now, we're going to hear about Superman and the latest from the Metropolis football team poisoning case. In time of disaster, natural or nuclear, medical aid may not be available. That's why one member of each family should take a Red Cross first aid or home nursing course now. Now another episode of Superman and the Metropolis football team poisoning case. This episode was originally broadcast 83 years ago, September 29th, 1941. Presenting the transcription feature... Superman! Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Yes, it's Superman! Strange visitor from the planet Krypton who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, 
then steel in his bare hands. And who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. And now to our story. Clark Kent, in an effort to secure an antidote to the brain-numbing potion given the members of the Metropolis University football team, has gone to the jungles of Central America, where a tribe of savage, head-hunting Indians known as the Narwhans are said to possess the antidote. On the advice of John Carter, manager of a rubber plantation, Kent hired a local white derelict known as Tango Pete to lead him to the Narwhan tribe. But that night, the head-hunting Indians attacked the plantation, captured one native worker, and with Tom-Tom's beating and weird savage cries echoing through the jungle, closed in on the cottage where Kent, John Carter, and Tango Pete waited, armed with rifles. Behind the cottage, a hundred plantation workers are huddled in deadly fear of the approaching savages. On the screened porch, Kent, Carter, and Tango Pete peer into the darkness as the jungle drums beat out an eerie warning of doom. Listen. Keep a sharp lookout, Kent. There's no telling how many of the black beggars there are. Okay. Pete. Right here, Mr. Carter. I thought you were friendly with the now one. Pete, don't you know that chief? Oh, I knows him right enough. Chief Sanger's his name. But he ain't out there. How do you know he is? He don't move much, Chief Sanger don't. He's a bit on the old side, he is. Old dried up like a prune. No, he ain't out there. Isn't there anything that you can do to stop them? Well, you heard me try. They want five heads, they says. Five heads to stick up on that blooming pole. Now, if I was you... Try talking to them again. Tell them we'll give them... Tell them we'll give them food and, and jewelry. I ain't gonna do no good. Well, try it. Why do I Fire, fire! Fire, fire! Well, I'd shut them up at least temporarily. Go ahead, Pete. Food and jewelry. You've got to wait till he answers. What does that mean? It means, is we ready? Ready for what? To give him five eggs, I type it. Offer them food and jewelry. Hurry, Pete. No one! Thunder! My own back! Blimey, I don't know how to sign jewelry in their blooming language. Listen. What does that mean, Pete? Five eggs or nothing. All right. Tell them it's nothing. No. Wait, I've got a better idea. We'll give them five men. You can't do that, Carter. It's murder. Don't worry, I'm not giving them five men. We'll try working a ruse. Are you game to go out there with me? What's that, Pete? They want to know what's holding up the works, as you might say. All right, tell them we'll give them five men. Right, oh. I go, Father What's your plan, Carter? Now listen carefully. You, Pete, and I will go out to meet them with two of the native boys. Hold on a minute, Mr. Carter. I go, Pete, I ain't getting social with them now on Ed Hunters. Not on your life. And why not? It's my understanding that you are on friendly terms with the now on tribe. Matter of fact, it's been rumored that you haven't been above supplying them with native victims. That's a lie. The right of skull can prove it. I never turn no one over to them bloody even. How is it you can speak their language? I've always wondered about that. Oh, I picked it up doing a little trading with them. That's the truth. So help me. What sort of trading could you do with savage Indians except trading in human beings? Well, you've got no right to say that, Mr. Carter, you ain't. Oh, I wonder. At any rate, you're going out there with us, whether you like it or not. You're the only one who can speak their gibberish. Now, what about you, Kent? I know I've got no business asking you to risk your life. I'll go but... along. As a matter of fact, I'd much rather tackle them alone. Don't be a fool, man. They've got blowguns and poison darts. All five of us will meet them, armed with the two rifles with a revolver I have in my office. Can you handle a rifle, Mr. Kent? I think so. You'll take the revolver, Pete. You can't give me no orders, Mr. Carter. I ain't going out there, I ain't. You'll do as I say. I'm running this rubber plantation, and I've put up with enough from you for a long time. I've closed my eyes to your petty thieveries and your lying and your dishonesty. It ain't true. It ain't true. Shut up. I'm giving the orders now, and I don't want any more talk. There it goes again. Probably got tired waiting. Tell them we're coming, Pete. I don't have to if I don't see them. Tell them we're coming or I'll put a bullet through your head. Right, all right. So don't have to use them tactics, Mr. Carter. Kid, I like you. Never mind what's like me. Now, hurry up. I'm worrying. Hurry up. Hurry up. What did they answer? I didn't catch. You're lying in your teeth. It doesn't matter now. I'll go back and get the two boys in the revolver. Keep an eye on him, Kent. I don't trust him. Right. I'll be right back. Now, what do you suppose got into Mr. Carter? It ain't a bit like him. It ain't ducking up this way. If you takes my advice, boy, boy, you'll wash your hands of this business. 
He's making a big mistake. He is a big mistake. Him no one they ain't no bloomin' beggars to mess with, they ain't. And yet you were willing to take me to their chief for five hundred dollars, a hundred of which I've already given you. Taking yet old chief Sanga in the daytime ain't meeting up with a bloomin' hundred of them at night. And there's something else you got to remember. We ain't going to be able to get that medicine you come down for if we antagonize the no ones, we ain't. I'm sure Mr. Carter realizes that and has taken it into consideration. I wouldn't be too sure if I was you. He's looking to keep his head on his neck, he is, and that's the truth of it. He don't care a bit whether you get your medicine or not. You can take it from me. Why don't you stick with me, bully boy? Why don't you tell him he ain't got no stomach for mixing with them now on? If we pull solid on both oars, he'll do the trick it will. He'll back water. And then what? You say there are a hundred of them out there, armed with blowguns and poison darts. They won't bother you and me. You got my word for it. We ain't exactly enemies, if you get what I mean. Yes, I think I do get what you mean. Well, how about it? This is my answer. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Leave me loose I now. think we'll put hey, you to sleep for a while. Good night, night Pete. Oh. Yeah, it's much better. Now to deposit you in some safe, secluded place for the time being. Let's see now. Now, the back of that truck parked out front looks like it might do. Up with you, my bully boy. Open the screen door gently. There we are. Yes, that truck will do nicely. In you go. Now, I think it's high time Superman took over. I can probably handle those headhunters without any bloodshed, and as Pango Pete said, it doesn't pay to antagonize them. Uh oh. I'd better duck behind the truck and get these city clothes off before Carter spots me. I think the Nawans would enjoy seeing me in full costume. There. That does it. Now, let's see what savage headhunters look like from the air. Up! Up! And away! There they are. Hiding in the brush at the edge of the jungle. There's a lot more than a hundred. Some of them seem to be carrying spears. I'll drop a little lower. Down! Down! Yes, a few of them have spears. Probably with poison tips. Uh, they're certainly bloodthirsty looking creatures. All painted up with bones stuck through their nostrils. I no wonder Pete didn't want to meet them in the dark. I said he didn't. They're enough to frighten anybody. What would happen, I wonder, if I just dropped down in the middle of them? No, I don't think that's so smart. Yeah, that looks like a clearing over to the left. I'll drop down and watch them from there. Down! There you are. Yes, this is as good a vantage point as any. Now we'll see what happens. Uh oh. They're getting impatient again. That means trouble. Yes, they're moving out of the brush toward the cottage. I think I'd better... St- what happened? Great Scott! Carter's coming out of the cottage with four native boys. He's going to face them. He can't do that. It's suicide. Oh, and look, they're shooting poison darts at him. <coughs> He's firing. Carter! Go back, you fool! Go back! Carter! Now I'll have to take a hand. Up. You beggars, try your poison dark on me. Come on. You with that spear. Come on, pitch it over the place. Yeah, yeah didn't think I could catch it, did you? Watch out. Here it comes back at you. Yeah. Oh, it's not in the gang up for me, have you? Okay, see how you like this. Yeah. Take that. Yeah. That'll take care of you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, stick around, you beggars. Don't tell me you've had enough. What are you running for? No, oh, you can't take it, huh? I didn't think so. Yeah. Well, now to get back to Carter. That's Clark Kent. That's funny. He's gone. Last time I saw him, he was halfway between the cottage and the jungle. Maybe he's in the cottage. There's a light on. Well, Mr. Carter, I... Great Scott. He's stretched out on his bed, white as a sheet. Boy. Boy, what happened to him? Poison dart. What? Where did it hit him? In arm. This one. Let's get a look at it. 
Come on, rip this sleeve off, will you? Yes, I see it. Just a pinprick, but it's red and swollen. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, what can I do for you? Just tell me. Nothing. Nothing to do. All over soon. But there must be something. Some some antidote, some medicine. Indian have medicine. But wait. Facing slow but certain death as the venomous poison seeps into his bloodstream, John Carter can only gasp that the Darwan Indians have the only antidote. And so, once again, Kent is faced with the problem of getting an antidote for a native drug. But this time, minutes count. What can Kent, even as Superman, accomplish? Don't miss the next episode. Listen in with Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with... Superman! Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! And there you have it. So, are they good? Is he going to be able to save this guy? We'll see what happens. 83 years ago, September 29th, 1941, Superman, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Have yourself a great day. We'll see you tomorrow for more Classic Radio Theater. I'm Wyatt Cox.